Welcome back to the Grow Yourself podcast. Today, I have a guest with me who has been here a time or two before. So please tell us your name, your business, where you are growing, and what you do. Hi, everyone. I am Ashley Irene from Heirloom Potage. We are based out of uh, Southern California, specifically in Orange County. And I design bespoke edible culinary gardens. And culinary is the key word here. These are the most (laughs) edible, beautiful gardens I have seen, starting with your front yard. Yeah, Uh, which totally is still there. Yes. Um, It is the hit. I'm super excited. We're actually going to be on our upcoming uh, neighborhood home and garden tour this spring. Wow. I'm really excited about that. And it was just a transformational thing. I think I've mentioned before, it was this kind of wild hair idea that I had. And my husband said, this is either the best idea you've ever had in your life or the worst. And You're like, honey, I have good ideas every day. Only good ideas. Just wait till tomorrow. Exactly. (laughs) And um, it's such a huge draw. Like, it is such a great conversational piece. Yeah. It's, It's just like my neighbors come up. They ask questions. People come from other places. Um, this last um, coming up this last year, we have a bunch of garden clubs that are going to come and start touring the gardens. So fun. They are all kind of really excited, and I it puts a little bit of pressure on me. But also, like that showcase garden is just such a great place for me to test out ideas, try new varieties, and really just kind of push my creative boundaries. And what a beautiful place to do it. Did I interrupt you before you said where you were? Gardening. I think I just jumped in because I was thinking about culinary. Ah, no, we're, yeah, we're in Orange County, California. Orange County, okay. And Orange County's big, yes, no? Yes. And we, um, we've got cool micro, like, we've got a variety of microclimates. So we're technically 10B. Okay. Um, we do have a couple of ranges that I would say are more a little 10A, but then we also have microclimates because we have, there's a huge difference. So I actually live in Santa Ana, which is, um, several miles inland from the coast but then we have we service clients that are on the coast and they have their own kind of microclimate which is really cool yeah and we've learned how to cater to those clients as well and i'm not a californian so forgive my ignorance (laughs) is la included in orange county it is not la county is right above us and actually we just started servicing la county hello hollywood (laughs) the gardens are coming yes i love that okay so orange county not la but very close close enough for you to just step over the line and start gardening there too yes and so we had a lot of clients who we kind of just said no that's kind of outside of our service range and as we looked to grow and scale the company i was like okay nope we can do this um we actually were able to bring on a fellow a former um gardenery uh certified consultant Ah. to also start working with us she just realized that like she had another part-time job and she was like i'm gonna lean further back into that uh but for your projects yeah i'm there and so of course my goal is we'll keep you know bringing her on and doing more stuff together yeah but it's really awesome to have somebody who understands the quality understands like the systems the process the way that we garden Mm -hmm. it's so good to have somebody like that on your team yeah and like heading into to fancy town hollywood i love it not that orange county isn't fancy town speaking of (laughs) soon after you set up this gorgeous showcase garden in your front yard i mean you went you're bold i love it you're like (laughs) Halo, anyone who's driving by, look what I can do. And I mean, it's not just going to be like open and shut, right? This thing is like open for eyes any day of the week. And if I remember correctly, recently or like within the last few years, were you on the cover of Orange County Magazine? I was. Yeah, that was a huge surprise to us. Uh, it's been a, about a, a year, maybe a year, two years yeah. now. Um, but like, yeah, we, um, I, I unfortunately was not a subscriber at the time, uh, but my tell. neighbor was, and they were like, oh, like my literal neighbor across the street, and they just, he brought it over. I was on the phone with one of my best friends in the world, and I literally screamed out loud. Did <laughs> because you? Because I oh, had no know? idea. I had no. no idea. I knew we were going to be in the magazine. Okay. I had no idea that my house was going to be the, on cover the cover of a magazine. And so, wow. yeah, now my goal is like, okay. Better Homes and Gardens. I know, like Arch Digest when you come in. <laughs> like, get on the list. You're gonna have to wait. Exactly. That's so amazing. Okay, so you have this magazine-worthy kitchen garden in your front yard. Have you always been a garden pro? Like, where did this? Where did this? You know, uh, 
green thumb come from? It started, I um, am a California transplant. So I grew up in Wisconsin and I grew up on my grandmother's farm. And I really thought this was how everybody lived. My grandmother kept an amazing kitchen garden and fed our family. And she, you know, practiced intensive planting and companion planting like well before like I knew that there were terms for it. Yeah. So I really just thought that this was how everyone did it. Yeah. And um, I've just realized that like when I look back on how I got to this point, you know, like as a high school kid, I would have said, absolutely not. I'm never going to do this. Exactly. <laughs> like, this is not my career path. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. Like, it, it's, it's, this is like such a great job. It gets me out of an office. It gets me interacting with people, really pushes my creative side. Mm-hmm. Um, I get to be the art kid that, you know, my parents at one point were really kind of nervous that I wouldn't have a career. I wouldn't have a business. I wouldn't be able to have a stable income to support myself. Did you study art? I didn't. Oh. I was kind of discouraged at that point. Like they were like, yeah. we, don't, we don't want you to be a starving artist. And yeah. so um, I was allowed, like I went to art school as a kid, uh, all through high school. I went to an arts charter school. And so I have a lot of classical art training. Mm-hmm. And then I went to college and I studied business. And wow. then I decided to get a master's degree and study more business. And so I feel like I have a really good setup for being an entrepreneur, but like the journey is also so different. Yeah. Um, and now I feel really kind of good about like where we've gotten the business to. And now it's time for me to actually transition from kind of running in the business and operating the business to completely running the business from behind the scenes. Yeah, that's so cool. So if you are an OG listener to the Grow Yourself podcast, (laughs) Ashley's been here two times before. Uh, Our first season was in 2020, and you came on in uh, the spring, I think May. I'll never forget, I was at the nursery buying survival plants, you know, COVID (laughs) survival plants. And you tagged me on Instagram. You already had your business name. You were all set up. And I'm like, who is this rock star, heirloom (laughs) protege, like gorgeous business name. And it was literally the height of, I mean, the plant store was open, but not much else. And I watched you just create this business out of nothing into a really big something. So she's on in May 2020 and then again in, I think, February of 2021 because I was just watching you grow like a tomato on an arch (laughs) trellis. And it was like fantastic. So if you want to hear her full story, we won't dive into all of it today, but it is quite a beautiful story. And uh, how does it feel now to be, you're in your third, you just basically are about to finish your third full year. Yeah. So, so how do you feel differently now than uh, let's, let's go back to like the COVID day when you were first starting, how different is it? I mean, it's kind of a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. It's like we've had so many, so much growth and so many challenges and, but we've been able to overcome them. And I think that has been like, that's a test, like that's, it's a testimony for myself, Um, you know, because there have been, there have definitely been days where I'm like, you know what? I don't know how we're going to keep heirloom protege going. Yeah. And those days are really, really hard. And then you share them with somebody that really means the world to you. And they literally, without missing a beat, go, absolutely not. You can't. You cannot. We are not, like, we're not going to let you, like, I'm not going to let you do this. Yeah. And they kind of get you motivated. And then you do things like this, where you get to come and be a part of a summit with like-minded people who are at all sorts of different phases of their journey. And you get to get kind of re-inspired and you remember like why you started Mm -hmm. um like I still know why I started like I absolutely love gardening and I love food and I think food is the way of the future I am so like I am so saddened when I meet high school students who have no idea what a vine ripened tomato tastes like they don't even know what it looks like yeah I like I still there's times when like you go to the grocery store and you're you know, you buy an actual heirloom tomato for, you know, $8 for this gorgeous one. tomato. You buy <laughs> one and somebody, you put it on the conveyor belt and, and you know, the beggar is like, what is this? Yeah. And you're like, it's an heirloom tomato. And they're like, what is that? And you suddenly have that realization of like, we are so disconnected from mm-hmm. our food mm-hmm. and the f- like where our food comes from, how it's grown. Like people don't realize that you know, how long it takes to grow that cauliflower that is totally molding in your fruit 
drawer. Yeah, you know? and, you, and you spent money on it. You brought it in. It, it was shipped across the country, at least for me. Yeah. And then it ends up going in the trash. Like, best case, it goes in the compost pile. Right. But you grew up with this. This was normal to you. Yes. And you are a rare case <laughs> for American... <laughs> You know, what are you, 15, 20, 25, something like that? Yeah. You're totally. a young, young lady. <laughs> and um, and you grew up with this, but I would I would I would guess that probably 80, 85 percent of your peers in America have no idea. Yeah, they have absolutely no idea. I mean, even my husband does like there was no uh, foundation of knowledge mm-hmm. of like, oh, that's what it takes. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's like this is what it tastes like, yeah. um, you know, because you just were so used to, like, you were so, he was so accustomed to it. He was so accustomed to having, like, a busy working family that they just bought, you know, your canned tomatoes and all of these other things. And so I just, I want to help get people back. I think that's part of why I really try to focus on the culinary aspect. Like, when we design gardens for clients, whether they be uh, residential or commercial clients, like, one of my questions is, what foods excite you? Oh, like, I love that. what foods, like, what is your, you know, and a lot of times I'll be like, what is your heritage? Do you want to honor that? Do you want to grow, you know, peppers that you would typically, you know, Hungarian peppers because you are Hungarian? Do you, you know, are you a family from Croatia? Okay, what cool plants oh, can we so find neat. that might make, you know, your family recipes? So, like, that's a big part of, for me, where our name even came from. So it's this combination of, like, I love old things. I live in an old historic house. Um, I like old style gardens, like, like, castle gardens and things like that I'm really inspired by those and then the idea of a potager is this like you eat from the garden every day and I want to help people embrace that lifestyle and I think right now there is such a draw for people like they want that they don't necessarily trust themselves to create it or to have it or even realize that like it is so close to being within their grasp Mm -hmm. and I want to be able to help bridge that gap for people. That's really neat. It's like you're bringing the past, the best parts of the past to the to the present. And I think in some ways, the some of these past solutions, like the way we used to live, mm-hmm. even a hundred years ago, which is really not that long, we didn't have a lot of the problems that we have created for ourselves. And mm-hmm. so in some regards, a lot of the biggest problems that we are facing, not only here in America, but like really globally, the solutions are in our history. Mm-hmm. We just have to be willing to say, okay, we've advanced far enough. Now, how do we scale it back a little bit? Or how do we advance in ways that actually get us to living better lives? And I'm saying like living healthier, right? Yeah. We just had a little conversation about some books and about this idea of like eating wild and like how not nutritious our food is now yeah. that we get at the grocery store. That's just really frustrating and, and sad for me. And then, you know, I look at like my own family journey, right? My mom passed away. That's part of how heirloom potage got started is my mom passed away from a long battle with cancer. And yes, there's probably some like hereditary things, and some dietary things but like that's a that's a you know it it was a symptom like that was the cause of like how unhealthy we have become and so I myself has struggled with some of those things and so I want to get back to the place where we can have a future where like our grandkids you know grow up in a much healthier environment and they don't have to worry about getting cancer or getting sick and having a bunch of autoimmune diseases and things I love that I, I often think, okay, not everything needs progress. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. like some things definitely needed. Like I'm very thankful for a dishwasher, right? Mm-hmm. I'm very thankful for a washing machine. Um, but our food really didn't need to get need to get fixed. No, there were yeah. certain, th- like we need to go back. We need to be, I mean, I think just right now too, like even on a more global scale, like this idea of like regenerative farming, like it's totally new to so many people, but it's actually not new methods mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. Um, it's this it's this looking back at the, at the past to fix the future. Yeah. And there's something really beautiful about that. That's so cool. I love the mission. Okay, so bring us through your garden. Okay. The showcase <laughs> garden. Show it off to us <laughs> January through December. So I'm just going to call out the month. And you're just going to tell me the plants in the garden. You don't have to give tons of detail, but I'm going to say January and just tell me some plant names. So January is all about like 
leaves and roots for us, honestly. Yeah. Um, we Luck All, we get to grow all four seasons. The cool season is my absolute favorite. And yeah. it's my favorite for beginner gardeners as well because it's you get immediate success. Yeah. And um, so it's full of lots of herbs. This is the time when our herbs in, you know, in our Mediterranean climate just blossom. Like, yeah. er, like perennial herbs, they are just flourishing. Um, and for me, it's like comfort. Like it's those kind of cool crisp nights and it's soups. It's really a time of healing and going back to nature. So good. All right. So is February the same? Roots and leaves February and, and March are kind of similar. The later half of March is when we start really putting in our warm season crops. So it okay. seems early for other people. But like um, even for us, like we sometimes will overwinter. Like if we have beds that are in full sun during our cool season, yeah. we'll overwinter tomato varieties because then as soon as wow. our temperatures start warming, warming up in like late March or April we they immediately set fruit so it's kind of like that like beautiful arch like we've already gotten the greens you know the the tomatoes to vine over the arch they're meeting in the middle and then they set fruit and it is like an ex like it's just so amazing. Our the clients are always overwhelmed. Of California living <laughs> why everyone wants to come. So you're telling me that a tomato is over your arch starting in like the fall. Mm -hmm. It hangs out there. It's not got fruit on it, but it's just there and beautiful and green. Mm -hmm. uh, November, December, January, February. And like that same plant is going to pop fruit in February or early March. Uh, usually in March, late March, early April. Yeah, yes. But and it's, it's that old of a plant. Like it's, it's been in for months. Yes. And it sets. And, and I mean, usually like so these are so we've had really good success with that with the uh, Costa Luz. Costa Luto Genovese, mm -hmm. this beautiful Italian, oh, like, yeah. wrinkly heirloom, oh, which is wow. so good as a slicer or even for other things. Uh -huh. um, and, like, different cherry tomato varieties. And so it's just, cool. it's so much fun because then everybody's like, what? Um, and then we'll plant in new tomatoes, yeah. right? Like, we let those... Okay give us life and give us food and then we'll plant in new tomatoes at that same time mm -hmm. um and so from that transition then we start planting in our warm season garden so we'll start planting beans you know we'll take out our peas we'll put in beans we'll start putting in peppers in full sun locations because sometimes the nights are still cool yeah so we still get that beautiful transition of like fresh lettuces and things like that but you you start getting to change up your salad okay so we got tomatoes we got peppers we got cucumbers maybe not nope. yet going not, in yeah but not coming out yeah going in um we'll start putting in our summer squashes because they also don't they like those a little bit cooler they don't like that super intense sun mm -hmm. unless they're really healthy you know well fertilized plants mm -hmm. um but we start putting in our warm season and then as we transition into kind of those warmer months of june and july mm -hmm. uh, we'll start putting in our hot season plants okay and then the garden really has to be set Got it. For us. We, because it's about to get tough. It's about to get tough. It's yeah. a, if if we haven't done that like we finally <laughs> have decided to just unfortunately break people's hearts, but like we just don't install gardens anymore during yeah. kind of like August, like September and October because mm -hmm. it is typically too hot. Yeah, you don't like dead gardens. Nope. Yeah, so and you don't want to give that to someone. I, exactly. I don't want to discourage somebody <laughs> like that. Like yeah. they immediately think this is so much harder than it needs to be, and it's it's not. It's just because that plant really needed those extra three or four months of yeah. being in the soil to get itself so healthy that like it isn't gonna die like so maybe you, a couple will but not all you were already in with you yeah then well done because your garden's going to make it through the tough months yes but you don't want to start then no Got and it. so if you come to us in august september or, or october or even if you come honestly if you come to us in june or july we have to push you off till Wait. fall got it and depending upon our upcoming schedule we might even have to push you off until like the new year yeah so this actually like now we're recording this here in November, this is the start of our busiest season. So we've just done our first changeover, our weather mm -hmm. friendly cooperate cooperated in California. We just spent a couple of weeks of doing garden changeovers and refreshes for our existing clients. And is that to cool season or to warm season? To cool season. Okay. And okay. we have put in a, like we will like for certain certain garden locations we might put in a couple of things. So like we've also we have a couple of clients where like they get really good sun and we'll overwinter um pepper plants. Oh, that so can cool. withstand a little bit and it's cool because they still get really um, big and healthy. But we have to remember that like our cool season, our fall is typically what a lot of the rest of the country's kind of 
peak summer can be. Mm -hmm. And so that's just a really fun time. But um, yeah, yeah, like right now, like Jan, like we really hit the ground running because we know everybody's busy. Like November and December are gone in a blink of an eye. So Mm -hmm. we do just a handful of installs and then we hit the ground running in January, February and March. That's when we're really in the busiest. That's our that's our spring. (laughs) <laughs> so cool, right? And I bet you get to surprise so many people because in their minds, I think we just all like, especially in the U.S., it's like summer is, garden is, time outside is June, July, August. Yes. And you get to walk in and be like, uh-uh, it's <laughs> January, friend. It's December. It's February. You're going to have the fullest garden and we're really far away from July. Absolutely. And because we want you to start then when it's going to be the easiest, when it's going to be the most fun, when you're going to have the most success and then you get to grow all through. Right. So we want you like loving your life. Yeah. Loving this, you know, heirloom potager style life by July. Yeah. And we want you excited to try eggplants, which so many of our clients are like, I don't know what to do with it. And you're like, I've got a hummus recipe. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I've got so many recipes. Let me sing you my favorite cookbooks. I so. love that. Okay. So speaking of plants, uh, what's, can you give us a breakdown, a step-by-step of a certain plant that you love teaching people how to grow? Oh, wow. I love growing so many plants and we grow a lot of them. Um, I think one of the things that I like we have found that we're really transitioning into that clients are getting really excited about is a lot more perennials. So we um, I have an espalier, some espalier apple trees and we are starting to see people. Yeah. So they're a living fence in front of my in my front yard in in our showcase garden. So cool. Um, We're getting a lot of requests for those. And people really shocked that in Southern California you can get fruit from apple trees specifically Teach us and so Ashley. for us the secret like so the secret for us is really picking the right variety of fruit trees okay um ones with low chill hours for us so you're looking for something with like under 200 chill hours since we don't actually ever get a frost oh what's a chill hour uh so chill hours are hours below what is it 50 degrees Okay. 55 or 45 degrees okay. um and so fridge ish like yes fridge like okay. not freezing Got it. um some some varieties do like an actual hard frost the fruit the, the tree does better it reserves and saves a lot of its uh new, like sugars and stuff to create really great fruit but those chill hours if you don't get enough you typically don't get fruit production and unfortunately like you know the garden system um sometimes they don't care so like your big box stores and stuff they get you know, we'll go there and people are like, fruit trees, $15. I'm going to stock up instead of paying, you know, $300 for years. And you're like, yeah, that is a 600 hour uh, chill hour variety. <laughs> and that it's, grows in Wisconsin. Yeah. And we're here in California. So <laughs> like, it's good it's, luck with that. It's going to be green and it probably might not be green for that long. Like it's going to struggle here. And who will they blame when that happens? Totally us that oh. we didn't tell them. Or not even you. They blame themselves, right? <laughs> or if they, bought, if yeah, they bought it. Exactly. So, uh, this is what breaks my heart is people go buy those things and it doesn't work. And it's, instead of blaming the store, they blame themselves. That's very true. And Sad. and it becomes hard and then they become discouraged. So for us, um, yeah, we've just had we have a bunch of upcoming um, orchard installs and perennials. And I think cool. those are such for me. I love installing and inspiring people to grow those because there's something that's going to be in your landscape for a while. They're usually high production. So like blueberries can be such high production and they taste a lot different than blueberries you're gonna buy at the store yeah and um it's all about that and then you know for our clients that have kids or even clients who are empty nesters you know it's that like entertainment value it's that like look at my cool landscape and look at these beautiful trees have you ever seen trees like this before yeah so how do you do the espalier did you do it against a fence or your home or out in the landscape and build a, a structure for it's, it yeah we built a structure for it so we have a um a very like a tension wire uh, fence and we worked with a local local forger who created some really cool beautiful posts put them in and um put the trees on there and so now since we're lucky enough to be having our own nursery we are actually starting to do some like multi-grafted um and different variety of espalier trees because there's just there's they're hard to find and if you do find them um in orange county they can be a good a very a good investment Wow. Okay. And then are you pruning it um, yearly? Yes. We prune and um, we offer, we just start offering or we offer a, a pruning and a fertilizing 
every season for for our clients who do that. So that's also been like wow. a really cool way to grow uh, the business. Okay, so give us a quick like pruning lesson. Obviously, it helps to have a visual. But mm-hmm. if you could paint a little picture for us, what are we pruning when we're pruning uh, an espalier? So you're, the first thing is to look for whenever you're, pr- so you're looking for branches that are coming, growing outward. You're looking for branches that are crossing. Okay. Um, and you're looking to thin out. So the key to production on an espalier, so particularly an apple, they actually grow off these really short little branches. So anything that is really super tall, that's most likely going to be a water sprout. And you're going to want to cut those off okay. because they're just sucking up a lot of time and energy and sugars from your tree. So we'll remove those. Mm-hmm. And then we'll remove branches that then suddenly start really coming outward. So in this case, espaliers are grown in a flat plane. Yeah. And you want to kind of keep that. The only ones we will not cut off um, is if there is a specific design or structure that we're trying to do with our espaliers. So like if we want this tree to now be growing up to another level, we will pick the two strongest uh, branches that might be growing upward. We'll encourage that to actually grow up to another level and then we'll train them by slowly bending them. But um, there's a bunch of different varieties. So we've done it with a couple of different projects where we've done some where they're like fans. Yes. And so again, for that, um, they weren't even trees in this case. They weren't even trees. They were actually like the redirect trees at a, at a local nursery where nobody wanted them because they weren't really beautiful, like columnar full. style. Yeah. They weren't full. And I was like, that's going to be perfect because so we can cool. trim those branches out to be... Um, into this beautiful fan shape and then we got our, the right trellis support system and so less is more and that's really hard for me to say because as you know more I am is a more. <laughs> more is more like I am a maximalist gardener yeah that is my aesthetic that is my style that is like what feeds my soul I love the title let's just put it out there <laughs> Ashley the maximalist gardener <laughs> love 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 yeah so less is more unfortunately okay. though with a with an espalier tree less is more that's what's going to get you your fruit production that's what's going to get you the style the shape um and just success and a fruit tree in a small space which is pretty amazing exactly like that's where you can actually do you know if you want a beautiful driveway like this is a really good way to pick a variety that doesn't have tree like roots that uproot and and are going to disturb any concrete or anything like that but definitely small make the most of those small spaces and then just how cool like have something that you can share with your neighbor or just something that's photo worthy or something that just brings a smile to your face when you come home like you want to create your home or your business and as a place that is just welcoming and makes people happy and espalier makes people happy yes and it's a fun word to say how long does it take to get fruit on an espalier tree uh so it depends upon how far along like how old your tree might be so Mm -hmm. a lot of times we'll start with trees that are like two or three years old and they should be ready to actually start producing fruit we do tend to recommend to our clients that you take your fruit off the first year right after after um, planting. Yeah. And the only reason is because we are really trying to get that tree to be as successful as possible. So that first fruiting will recommend that clients take off the fruit just so that all of that energy can go into building the healthiest root system as possible and a little bit stronger branches so that it can actually hold a decent amount of fruit. Mm-hmm. Um, but then usually like the year after planting, you can actually start getting fruit and enjoying harvests and amazing having like the most delicious juicy nectarines and peaches and apricots and apples and stuff like that oh my gosh i gotta do it listening to you i'm like (laughs) picturing where am i going to put my espalier so um i love a key point i want to bring out for everybody listening is she really ashley said you've got to find the right fruit tree for where you live yes that's critical and then starting to prune early on right so catching it and training it it's just like your puppy Right. You got to tell it from the beginning because you can't teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> I know because I didn't teach my dogs nothing. <laughs> and now they are wild and crazy seven year olds. So uh, you got to catch your tree at the beginning. Right. Absolutely. OK. So you are a superstar. Uh, you're espaliering trees. Is that a verb? Espaliering something like that? It is now. Um, uh, how could you like just. What does it mean for you for this to be your life now? Like that you went from MBA uh, and, you know, your old, they can listen to your story. Um, You're like, you're, you're living out your mom's dreams for you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but what does this mean for you? Like when you wake up in the morning, the tough days come, but overall, like what does it feel like to you that this is your life? I had, so I had somebody really close to me ask me about that. And they said, even on your worst days, is this like, does going to work make you happy? And again, without missing a beat, I said, absolutely. I love what I do. I, you know, it, there are so many different like little hurdles, but as a whole, like when you look at the whole duration of a year or all of that, it's pretty even keel. I love what I do. I love the fact that like every day doesn't always look the same. And I love the joy that we got to bring. I think that was, I like, that was one of the things we talked about. That was my mom's dream for me is, you know, when we knew that her time here on earth was coming to an end, she said, I want you to do something joyful, something that brings joy to the world. And at the time I was a branding consultant and I thought, well, I do. And she's like, do you? And it, you know, it really hit me. And so in this case, yeah, I bring joy to the world. I, you know, I just like, I think about like the children or even the grandparents and stuff that clients that we work with and watching them pull a carrot out of the ground. Yeah, There is nothing more exciting than pulling a carrot out of the ground. And I know it sounds silly and foolish, but at the same time, like it's just fun. And you, you know, there's that element of surprise. There's that like a moment of like, yes, I did it. Absolutely. And it encourages you to keep going. And so I just, I'm really thankful and grateful and happy. And I love being able to see other people's success. Like um, this last year, I kind of felt like, oh my gosh, I just had my head down to the ground and was working so much that I wasn't bringing it up to kind of look at what other people were doing. And so having been able to be here at the summit and really con- connect with other people and have them be like, oh my gosh, I love this thing that you do. I'm like, really? Because I love this thing you do. And hearing about that has just been absolutely awesome. And I know that I'm, we have what it takes, absolutely. right? Like we've accomplished something that like, you know, you're reminding like small businesses don't always succeed. That's the right. bulk of them fail within the first year. And I was adamant we weren't going to do that. And now, you know, we're not going to fail. Yeah. I'm going to figure out how everything is solvable. I think that's like the other thing is like everything is solvable. And if you wake up and you feel joy and you know you're bringing joy, yeah. that'll get you up in the morning, right? That's yes. your coffee. I love it. Okay, what's your big dream? What's what's the like if you could look back when this whole thing is never done, of course. Never done. Uh, no but, garden but is what, ever done. <laughs> what would make you feel so happy? Uh, what big accomplishment are you going for? I want to change the world. I, this, like, this is a profession that can change the world. I want to change my immediate community. I want to go bigger. I want to, you know, one day design a culinary garden in Europe. Um, I want to, you know, work with some really cool chefs that are in other countries who have a kind of little bit different approach or philosophy to cooking. I want to work with somebody who is just like, you know, I want to create, you know, I'm, I'm, want to do a B&B and I want to make it this like awesome destination place and the food is at the heart of what we do because that's how we show love like I want to do that I want to do that for the client you know the clients who are just like food is such a huge part of my the way I show love to the world and I bring joy and I want to be able to do that for them and partner with them and build their confidence and so um another uh consultant said to me (laughs) they're like girl you have the ability to build an entire world, an entire empire. And I was like, ooh, that sounds a little intimidating. And then I was like, but wait, I get to do that on my terms. Yeah. And that if I can be somebody who can ins- like who can inspire others and continue learning from others and then also hire. Yeah. Like for me, that's a big part of what I want to do is I want to be able to be um somebody who employs really good people and helps them shift so that it's not a job it's something joyful that they get to do um that's just like so that really makes me feel really good like that is something that just it makes me feel like my time here on earth is gonna be a worthwhile adventure i love it and you're well (laughs) on your way to changing the world full of joy bringing joy tell everybody listening where they can find you where they can follow you and how they can get you to come change their world <laughs> so you can find me we are pretty much heirloom protege across all social facebook uh instagram I, i'm not on tiktok but yes we do have a tiktok uh, account under heirloom protege you can find me at heirloom and that is p-o-t-a-g 
E-R. Thanks for spelling that for us. <laughs> Erlen Potage, Ashley is your woman. She is changing the world and she can help you change yours. Thank you so much for being part. It's an honor to be part of what you're doing, a small part of your big dream. And uh, I love following you and learning from you. I'm going to go home and find an espalier spot. Yes. And um, <laughs> I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you so much. Yeah. Everybody, thanks for listening and watching the Grow Yourself podcast. I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening to the Grow Yourself podcast. You can keep listening anywhere you love getting your podcast delivered on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, iHeartRadio, you name it, we are there for you. And if you want to read the notes and get our free resources to help you grow more, you can go to Gardnery.com slash podcast.